It's my office. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh no. Now it's saying, oh, sorry. It's okay. Right. Now it's saying my LinkedIn isn't at it. So I oh, am. Ew. Definitely want your LinkedIn on there. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Okay. Cool. I think I'm alive. <laughs> I see it. It's working. All right. All right. All right. All right. What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Red Pill versus the Blue Pill. I am Dr. Delon Canterbury. I am the founder of the Deprescribing Accelerator, as well as Geriatrics. And I'm here today with one of my good friends and colleagues and confidants, uh, Dr. Brittany Lamb. What is going on, Dr. Lamb? How are you? Nothing. I'm just enjoying, well, not enjoying the weather today, trying to stay <laughs> warm and dry and happy, happy to be here and happy for the new year and all the things we've got going on. So thanks for having me. Man, I'm pleasure to have you on board, man. You know, we met just a couple years ago talking about yeah. our passions for dementia, caregiver advocacy. So I'm so glad we can keep our momentum going, our friendship, and share a bit more on what we've learned, what we see on a day to day, really with over medications, right? That's mm -hmm. one of our pet peeves. So um, mm -hmm. go ahead and just give the audience a little rundown on um, your, your brief history of what you've yeah. been doing and what you're getting into lately. Yeah, so um, for everyone who doesn't know me, I'm Brittany Lamb. I'm an ER doctor. Um, I've been practicing now for as an attending for about six years, and I uh, got pretty burnt out by our healthcare system. And as part of what I decided to do to treat my burnout, was come online and educate and teach and start a, a business. So I run a small business that supports dementia families, uh, the people in the families that are making medical decisions for the person living with dementia. So I. I really stick to helping people anticipate and learn and plan for the medical issues that will come up with dementia and because the person is an aging human. So I think people are capable of learning what is to come and having a plan for how they're going to make decisions on behalf of that person. So I built a course and it's out there in the world and you can <laughs> buy it and take it and then you'll know what you need to know to have a plan. So. It was a need that I saw every, I still see every day in the ER. So, um, but yeah, that's why I'm here. And I love, love your mission because I think a lot of the reasons, a lot of the visits I see in the ER with people who are aging are because of medications in some way, you know, mm -hmm. it may not be the entire reason that they're there, but it played a, it played a part. So, um, so yeah, that's me. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I mean, you're an ER physician. You've said, I'm tired of seeing these admission codes for polypharmacy and prescribing cascade. And you say, you know what? I want to advocate better. I want to do something different. I want to create my own program and really hit home where people have the most need, right? Navigating mm -hmm. a tricky healthcare system, mm -hmm. knowing how to push back. And you have the inside scoop because you know how things work on the back end, right? You know, the admin yeah. stuff, you know what they're trying to force people to do. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious, you know, like just in this world of advocacy, what was something that really has resonated with you and how you help patients or how you help families really maneuver this complex landscape? Yeah, I think a lot of it is is language based. So it's communicating, you know, communicating with the team and just knowing what words to say. So, you know, the other not too long ago, I saw someone post on Facebook in one of the dementia support groups that they weren't allowed to come into the hospital because of their because not because of COVID. I can't remember what the situation was, but they weren't letting visitors in. And this was you know, more recent. So COVID restrictions have loosened up and I don't right. know what the details were, but I said, this is what you say. And I typed out this response, like call and talk to the, you know, the patient advocate. And if you can't talk to them, then talk to the charge nurse on the floor, tell them that you're concerned your person's going to become delirious and it's going to require medication to chemically sedate them. And then they're going to be in the hospital longer 
and have more complications and need to go to rehab and you know like this whole thing so she basically read that to this person on the phone and then she was allowed access into the hospital so and she commented back and told me like the same day it was so great so what? yeah it's like you know i never met this woman this is the power with it this is the power with us being willing to come online as professionals and help people i mean it literally took me five minutes or less to write that comment for her you know and i think i even like i even dictated it like spoke it and they typed it for me you know and it's crazy like all the good that you can do online so i think that's one of the big things is what I like to do inside of my course is these are the questions you need to ask. This is what this is the language. This is why we're doing what we're doing and teaching people kind of, like you said, the behind the scenes type stuff. Um, mm. So, yeah, that was one that was one powerful thing that stuck with me recently. That's super powerful. I mean, what would have happened if they'd not been seen? Right. Like what would have happened to that patient if you weren't there? So I think that's the piece in our professions that we tend to neglect is how much we're at our core just advocating. <laughs> we're just advocating. We're just educating and advocating and using a bit of our skill sets to help people get on to where they need to be. So I love that win. That's a great win. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so that that's one thing that's been going on recently. And then um, I've had, you know, a lot of people reach out to me and say that 2022 because they found my blog. Um, it kind of changed their year, which is so crazy. You know, I've never talked to folks and they're like, because of what you're writing on the internet, on your blog, which is hundred percent free, you know, yeah. it allowed me to have a conversation with my family, um, mm -hmm. to, you know, think about our goals and what we're doing with our healthcare, mm -hmm. you know, maybe go and update advanced directives and kind of understanding that the practicalities of those things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's just been, it's been really great coming online. And I think the, the power to help help people advocate for themselves. I think that's that's also the thing is that healthcare, there shouldn't be so many barriers to, to advocating for what's best for you. Yeah, there's a lot of education and understanding that you need to know to be informed and have a conversation, you know, but I think people people shouldn't be afraid to speak up and 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 you know advocate for your family, advocate for yourself. If something doesn't make sense, you know, just ask a question, you know, like, and people are afraid to ask questions of us, you know? And so I think just becoming more approachable, I think that part of being online is allowing people to see us, like you're a pharmacist, you're a professional, like you have all this expertise and knowledge and you're a human being just like I am. So yeah. it's making, making things a little more approachable. Yeah. Yeah. Approachable. Like you say, language matters, like knowing the codes that they will use to jump at whatever you need done. But like you said, we're in a digital age now. Like healthcare can be done over Zoom. It can be done over a phone call. It could be done with a text. And we're seeing models where this is being done and sometimes even built for. But mm -hmm. to your point, you know, I'm able to help people across the world, across the country with, with some some general advice around what I just know about the meds and hopefully incorporate some more of those deep prescribing opportunities worldwide. And that's, that's the whole point of this. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing some of that. So as we've had um, our discussion today titled, we're talking mm -hmm. about why an ER physician and a deep prescribing pharmacist are dementia's worst nightmare. And so for those who may not know, it's true. <laughs> we are here to take on this broken healthcare system. We're here to de-prescribe. We're here to stop polypharmacy, these prescribing cascades, and better educate clinicians so that they're a little more open to some of these suggestions, um, but also incorporate it sustainably into their standard of care. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know, I've actually done a number of discussions. In fact, I'm doing another one on Monday. It's a brain health symposium uh, with the Alzheimer's Association and AARP. And we'll be talking about which medications to avoid mm -hmm. uh, prescription wise or over the counter for mm -hmm. patients who may have some cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. um, and so, of course, you know, I always talk about how much my grandmother has played a role in me creating this company. Uh, for those who may not know, she had some mild cognitive impairment. And having suffered from that, uh, she was given an antipsychotic while she was in an assisted living facility. And she was given, uh, I believe, Zeprazidone in this New York clinic. And 
We didn't know why her behavior was out of control. We didn't know why she was getting worse, sundowning, but it got bad enough to where my parents had to move her from New York down to Georgia, where I'm currently now in my parents' home. And she was here. Uh, we had to actually childproof the house and do all types of things to make sure she doesn't escape. And she definitely found ways to escape. But needless to say, we found out after struggling for months that it was just one prescription that caused all of it. So four mm. months of health for my parents. I wasn't quite a pharmacist yet to advocate to the level that we do today, yeah. but it is why we are their worst nightmare. Because now we're going to take this on. We're going to hit um, the issue that we're seeing in real life, which mm. are unfortunately more and more of these senior living facilities inappropriately diagnosing Mm. our patients with with schizophrenia and bipolar mm. disorder mm. so they don't have to report how many of their patients are being chemically sedated mm. or basically using a pill to knock someone out so they're just drooling to the left mm. and so it shouldn't be like that but what are your thoughts there was a recent article that cms and the associated press highlighted mm. about this newer crackdown or newer focused crackdown mm. on stopping the use of antipsychotics um, that are being prescribed willy nilly. I mean, there's been yeah. almost like a, I don't know, I think a 20% spike in just the last couple of decades. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe some of that spike is because there's more people who are aging, but, um, but it's so complicated with dementia because there are, well, obviously we know there's a lot of turnover with staff. COVID caused a lot of havoc in a lot of these facilities. You have people who are inexperienced who don't know how to handle people living with dementia. And we know that medications are not first line in dealing with behaviors, which are mm -hmm. the symptoms of dementia. Mm -hmm. But there, I mean, there may also be other, there may be anxiety and depression and those things that are going on, but labeling someone as a newly diagnosed schizophrenic or bipolar disorder, when they have, you know, clearly have documented dementia and they're towards, you know, they're aging, it's highly unlikely that someone would develop schizophrenia or bipolar disorder at that time of life. Like that doesn't happen. You know, like we're talking in your twenties and your thirties, that's when we usually diagnose and start noticing the symptoms of schizophrenia. So that's very troubling. You know, um, I haven't seen that as much in where I practice, um, you know, around where I live and work. Um, but there are lots of patients that are on antipsychotics. And I think that it's a complicated issue because, you know, you want to keep people safe. You want to, you want to try to improve their quality of life. And it, it's an individualized decision and it should be a tool. It shouldn't be a go-to drug. Mm -hmm. It should be, we've tried mm -hmm. other interventions and we think that this might be worth the risk. And the family also needs to be educated about the risks, you know, the risk mm -hmm. of antipsychotics. I mean, they have a black box warning on them. You know, right. people who have dementia, you know, they but but when you look at the arsenal of meds that we have to treat, you know, behaviors and symptoms of dementia, we just don't really have any. And everything that we have all works in the brain. So, of course, mm -hmm. it can cause worse problems. <laughs> so it's 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 it's, yeah. it's a very complicated issue. And it we need to treat people as individuals. Um, people need individualized medical plans. And I think that that might not be happening because there's a lack of there's a perceived lack of time and decreased staff and reimbursement. Because if you don't reimburse physicians for their time, they will find a way to check the boxes and move on so they can right. get paid. So those are my thoughts, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, of course. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's, I love it. I love it. Um, it. It's, it's so sad that they've made the FDA black box warning for this back since 20, 2008 right yeah. this is over you know a couple of years decades almost and it's like what have we done <laughs> like what have we done if it's increasing and of mm -hmm. course like you say population numbers people are aging longer they're all mm -hmm. those are all factors but it's sad when there are even uh disparities in demographics with this like there was a study even showing that there's a 1.7 higher use of antipsychotics in black dementia patients mm. when compared to white counterparts. And that mm. was something I didn't know until a recent study. Mm -hmm. So it's crazy that now this use of chemical attacks here or whatever mm -hmm. uh, is, is in, in a way causing some marginalized differences and outcomes, which again, I did not know until I started looking into it. Yeah. So we're seeing hits with, with disparities there 
but we generally know dementia is going to be a higher prevalence in, in Latino and Black Americans. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there were a harm to themselves and you do have a legal, you know, justification mm -hmm. to use an antipsychotic? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not, but there's still a disparity that it needs to be addressed. So mm -hmm. I have thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of what I see, you know, it's it's pretty common. There's there's almost always a Seroquel somewhere. <laughs> um, don't really see clozapine as much. Yeah. Um, but I, I am so, 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 so tired of seeing benzodiazepines uh, and opioids. Like, yeah. so tired, so tired. And 70 year old, 80 year old women, like, what the hell are we doing? Like, can yeah. we do better? What are you seeing in the ER? Yeah, I definitely see benzos and, and narcotics prescribed long term for people who are aging, like daily prescriptions, not like, I broke my, I have a humeral fracture, I broke my arm, and I need a narcotic for a few days. Like, I mean, obviously, my my stance is that if people are or people have an acute issue, I think that narcotics can be a reasonable choice. I do think that people living with dementia need to have their pain addressed because we know that people who have a, a pain out of proportion and uncontrolled pain, it, it does cause delirium. So it does increase their risk of needing hospitalization and needing to be chemically sedated potentially mm. if they are not if their pain is not addressed. So. Um, but I think more education on um, on other ways to treat pain, topical meds, because the problem is, too, that's another issue. There aren't a lot of good pain medicines. you got Tylenol, which is pretty much safe in everybody. And you have NSAIDs, which are which can be a huge problem in people who are aging. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have and then you have like tramadol, which is a drug I don't like and um the narcotics um you know and then you've got topical stuff it's just that there isn't a lot to go to go to but the mm -hmm. chronic use of narcotics is a is a problem and it's something that i don't think my patients really understand when i tell them hey look you, how long have you been on this narcotic do you realize that if you stop taking it you're going to withdraw same thing with benzos like do you realize that if you don't take this it's going to make you sick and they're like mm -hmm. oh no didn't know that you know, and I'm like, did you know that this can make you constipated, this narcotic, mm -hmm. you know, right. and that it works in your brain? And, you know, no, I didn't know that. So it's a problem that people are not um, educated on the potential side effects of these medications, both in the short term and the long term. So, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. lots of problems with those drugs. And yeah. yeah. Lots of problems. They're expensive. And frankly, we don't even have evidence past three months. Like we really don't have strong evidence for chronic opioid use. Maybe, of course, for cancer related pains and yeah. other special situations. But truthfully, past three months, there's like no evidence that says you need to be on it. It's more, mm -hmm. hey, I need it now, you know, and you end up stuck. And I'm not saying everyone is a, a abusing or an addict, but no. it's, it touches the pain. Don't get me wrong. I've had a experienced Percocet myself lately after getting my wisdom teeth removed. Mm -hmm. So I get that, um, mm -hmm. but it's not the catch-all. And I mm -hmm. and what I think Western medicine may be missing is the biopsychosocial feedback of pain. Pain mm -hmm. isn't just your body. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a social element to it. There's a psychological element yes. to it. And they all feed into each other. And so it requires us to think a bit more holistically and maybe using mindfulness therapies. Maybe, of course, exercise can be an option. Maybe therapy, of course, I've already mentioned that. Mm -hmm. But having social support, having community, having people to, out of isolation and get you up and going and feeling like mm -hmm. an active member can honestly help your pain go away. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think that we, we have thrown a Band-Aid on pain because, you know, back in... Back before I was practicing medicine, we were told that the physicians in the medical community were told that these drugs were safe, you know, and and they mm -hmm. do help people with pain in the short term. So I think we were just throwing on them like, you know, band-aids. But but this is like a huge this this goes back to the problems that we see in healthcare, right? It's like mm -hmm. it's we want a quick fix and we're and we're gonna design things to react to problems instead of getting to the underlying issue. Like why is this person experiencing like crazy pain, you know, that we, that we see is real, like they're suffering. Right. And then mm -hmm. someone else who has the exact same condition doesn't feel that way, you know, like, mm -hmm. wouldn't mm -hmm. know. like what is, what is the difference between these two folks? And, you know, like you said, are there other things that we can do holistically to help this person so they don't have to use narcotics? I think that people, I mean, people living with dementia 
unfortunately, like the interventions and things that we may be able to do for them right now, I don't think are, I don't think are there. Like, I think we need to get people earlier on this, like fixing pain and looking at how they experiencing pain kind of journey before, before they develop dementia. But, um, but yeah, I think that, I think we, I think there's more work to be done in therapy, 100%, right? Mm, so like, yeah. we throw benzos at people because of society. <laughs> And it's not, it doesn't, you know, it's short term to panic. It doesn't treat generalized anxiety, right? So what we're showing, we're, we're throwing these medications at people and it makes them feel better. But right. the antidepressants don't make them feel better because it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And therapy is probably what people would benefit from the most. I tell my patients all the time, you got to see a therapist. These drugs are only half, they're a tool, right? They're not. Absolutely. So, so yeah, but I think. When you think about doing therapy, obviously for someone living with dementia, it's going to be, a, it's going to just depend on the person and on their abilities at that point. So, um, but yeah. 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 And just to circle back, I mean, sometimes we forget that chronic pain uh, can actually lead to dementia. It, it's a risk mm -hmm. for being mm -hmm. in dementia, like having low sleep hygiene. Uh, those mm -hmm. are another risk factors for dementia, just having a history mm -hmm. of depression can another be a risk factor. Yeah. So that's why I think, again, this whole, we got to treat the whole mind, body, spirit yeah. needs to be put into play. But following up with your point on the differences in like one patient versus another, that's the perfect segue for pharmacogenomics. A lot of these yes. patients, like you, yeah, like they go through these liver enzymes and depending how a person responds can be based on their genes. And that mm -hmm. can dictate should you take 100 milligrams or 10 milligrams of this oxycodone? Yeah. It makes a huge difference, but yeah. everyone is personal and everyone I think is shifting to more personalized care. Yeah. And I think that's what, you know, what we're able to do now, professionals coming online and providing education like this. I think we're, I think slowly we'll turn, turn the tide and, um, and change things, but pharmacogenetics is awesome. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. I mean, I'm not a primary care doctor. I'm an ER doctor, but you know, I think pharmacogenetics can save you from coming into the emergency department. You know, we could spout off lots of reasons why. I mean, one of them you just mentioned, like if you get a lower dose of a narcotic, it's more appropriate for you. You're less likely to have decreased breathing, decreased blood pressure, mm -hmm. increased falling, you know, mm -hmm. especially for someone living with dementia. So I tell people that with dementia, you know, it's it's not a bad idea to do this, you know, do, do pharmacogenetic testing as soon as we realize that some cognitive issue is happening, you know, when we're trying to get a diagnosis, like why not do this when we're doing that? And then if you know your person has dementia and, you know, they're not towards end of life, they're in the middle stages or maybe, you know, in the earlier part of the late stages, it could benefit them to have pharmacogenetic testing, especially if people are trying to give them medications to sedate them and to control behavior. So, um, so yeah, I think Pamela wrote a comment about pain patches being removed because a loved one doesn't know what it's for. That is, that is an, that is an issue, Pamela, that does happen, you know, um, and that could cause withdrawal if that's a fentanyl patch. I don't know what patch that is, Oof. but you know, that could cause a problem. I mean, also people who are living with dementia who are at home and they're managing their own medications, it's very common. They take too much insulin. They, you know, take too many of their medicines. They can take an extra dose of pain medicine and they can put mm -hmm. on an extra patch and not see it, you know, right. all kinds of problems. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. I went, I oh, I love it. No, 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 no. We love it. The comments are going wild. Uh, thank you, Pamela, for that um, comment. I mean, it's, it's so real. Um, but yeah, especially if we know what type of pain patch that is, that could be a, a, a big issue. Um, so thanks. But yeah, PGX, pharmacogenomics, personalized medicine is becoming the wave, is becoming the standard of care slowly mm -hmm. but surely. We do know that Medicare and Medicaid in some states actually does pay for that. For So that could be a question that you could pose with your provider if you were curious about that. Mm -hmm. You can always reach out to either of us if you have concerns or questions of what that means or what that may entail. Mm -hmm. But it's fairly straightforward. Cheek swab. You get results in about 10 to 14 days telling you based on your medicines, which um, are best for you or which may be inappropriate or which may be just completely ineffective. Mm 
-hmm. And so that's the beauty of some of this. It's not going to tell you everything, but it gives you a good rundown of some of the more commonly uh, seen medications. Pamela followed up and said, luckily, it was just a lidocaine oh, patch. Okay. <laughs> well, <that's> so <laughs> okay with that. Uh, but no, like when we're talking about these opioids, I mean, I was just doing a, a medication review today, right? And in talking with the caregiver provider, this poor uh, 85-year-old having, unfortunately, this uh, benign tuner causing all this pressure in his brain, and it's um, leading to cognitive impairment. So mm -hmm. here I am wondering, huh, he's a falls risk. He's on like three different blood pressure lowering drugs. Okay. Uh, his blood pressure was like 80 over 50 a month okay. ago. <laughs> and here we are sedating him and making this guy potentially fall out. So yeah. why is he on tramadol? And I asked that, and the caregiver was like, you know what? I don't know why. He doesn't have any pain. So he oh. doesn't have any pain, but why is he on I this can't. tramadol? Yeah, that's, <laughs> and this is, you know, this is what I teach inside of my course, and I talk about it online. It's like every, and you, and you are a champion of this. It's like every medication must have a purpose, and that purpose must go in line with the person's goals of care. So Correct. it's, you know, and if you're on more than five or more, five or more medicines, you know, you need to get with someone like Dr. Delon and go over, you know, medication, do a medication review. Your doctor should cover it on an annual visit. I mean, it's kind of crazy to me that we only cover it one once a year, <laughs> but, um, but 100% medications need to have a reason. And so I tell people like you, you, you can't just, this is how to sound crazy, but well, it's not. You can't just trust the healthcare system to be like best for you. Like you need, to, you need to question us and be like, why are you writing me this prescription? Make yeah. sure that you know why we're writing it. Like mm -hmm. tramadol. I hate tramadol. That's like one of my. I never. I, I hardly ever prescribe it. I almost. It's only if someone's taken it before that I'll give it to them. I. Don't, I hardly ever would write that as a new prescription for someone. There's just so many mm -hmm. weird things can happen with it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's one of the ones that people can be like a very over metabolizer or under metabolizer. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I've yeah. seen people like taking a tiny dose of it and being gorked, and then people who have taken <laughs> the same person being fine. It's yeah. just such a weird, weird drug. But. Yeah. I've absolutely filled 360 tramadols to like eight times a day. Six, like I've definitely done that. And it's like still not cutting their pain. Um, but yeah. like you said, no, it's, it's subjective. It's a genetically cleared drug. So depending on that variation, it, it does get cleared by uh, cytochrome uh, CYP2D6 as well okay. as CYP3A4. 2D6 okay. is the main pathway. And when it's cleared, that active drug is actually more potent or it works better than tramadol because it's a, uh, it's a pro drug. Mm. That all being said, if your genes say, nah, I don't like that, it's not going to work or mm -hmm. I love it. I'm going to clear it all now. It won't touch your pain. So that's yeah. that precision medicine lens that we're touching on and why pharmacogenomics, I believe, will be the standard of care, especially if insurers are covering it now. Um, outside of just Medicare, but Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare, are some of the more um, proponents of covering mm. uh, genetic testing with the right indications. So, but it, all of this still comes back to how we can do way better when it comes to how we manage people holistically, especially again in the dementia caregiving space. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I'd love to know, like, when you're in the ER, like, what are some patterns you may be seeing or witnessing in some of our seniors or just in general? Yeah, I think there's uh, there's a few things that I notice quite often. Um, like you just mentioned the man being on all the blood pressure medicine. So, you know, people living with dementia start to eat and drink less at a certain point, or if they get sick with some sort of virus or in pneumonia or anything like just any any illness, they eat and drink less, they get dehydrated, or they're losing weight. Um, and then we keep giving them their blood pressure medicines while they're sick or while they're not eating or drinking as much or they're losing weight. And people have kidney injury because of their low blood pressure. Now they fall and hit their head and are injured. 
um, you know, then they're not perfusing their brain because their blood pressure is low. They're not getting good blood flow to their brain. So that can cause worsening, you know, worsening memory issues in the short term. So blood pressure is a common thing that I see. Probably one of the most common thing in all aging folks is like being over medicated either Every day they're over medicated because no one's taken a look at this big picture for a while or they're they're acutely ill and now they're mm. being over medicated situationally. And yeah. so what I teach dementia family members is like it's all going back to the same thing, right? It's like, you know, every medicine they take, you know what they take and you know what it's for. And then you have a plan for those medicines going forward based on your person's goals of care. So, mm -hmm. you know. And then the, that ties into blood thinners. So blood thinners are a huge issue. Um, yeah. And, you know, they increase the risk of bleeding everywhere. You know, they're thinning your blood. And there's different ones. You know, the antiplatelets are not blood thinners, but they do increase the risk of bleeding still. Um, mm -hmm. So issues with those drugs and then issues with, like, traditional anticoagulants. And um, so those, those, those situations are probably the most common things that I see. And mm -hmm. then another big thing with everyone, not just people who are aging, not just people who are living with dementia, the NSAIDs causing GI bleeds. Um, yes. So the, that's like, people mm -hmm. just don't know, like people take naproxen and ibuprofen together on the same day, like all day long. <laughs> like for really? days, they're like, oh, my back hurts. Let me take some Aleve. Let me take some ibuprofen. And then it's, you know, just, just a downstream effect. So those are the anticoagulants, antiplatelets, then like any combination of antihypertensives, including mm -hmm. the beta blockers, yep. um, and one. then NSAIDs, and then obviously like narcotics, benzos, and antipsychotics. <laughs> and then also Benadryl in there. I don't see uh, yeah. as many. I don't see as many people taking Benadryl. Like no one's prescribing. Like I don't see people prescribing Benadryl, but I see people taking Benadryl and then not telling us that they're taking it. Right. So. Right. Absolutely. Man, that is, I love that. You really nailed some of the classes that I actually highlight in our fourth module of the de-prescribing accelerator. So we literally list out the top 10 medication classes that send seniors to the ER, which is mm -hmm. -da, Dr. Lamb's world. So we literally list NSAIDs as number one. We talk about blood pressure meds as like maybe number three or four. Mm. Cancer drugs is like maybe number eight. Mm. We talk about blood thinners, antiplatelets, uh, those warfarin type drugs, clopidogrel. Yeah. They all have a pretty significant risk if a person falls. And some of them even have genetic implications like our blood thinners. Plavix is a big one. Oh, yeah. you know, big one. So 2C19 is a huge one. So people, particularly those who may have Asian ancestry, mm -hmm. are more likely to be unable to process that drug. Mm -hmm. When that happens, you're going to be at risk of potentially having uh, strokes or a recurrent mm -hmm. stroke if it's supposed mm -hmm. to keep your blood thin. It doesn't because work. Exactly. It doesn't yeah. work. It won't yeah. work because your genes are saying it won't work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our dementia patients may be on some of these drugs, right? Let's be honest. When people have dementia, they, they have all types of chronic conditions going on. Mm -hmm. So it's important to keep all of this in play, not just for the patient's well-being, but for the caregiver and the provider. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I think that's a perfect talking point about falls, falls mm -hmm. and dementia and like we know that there's going to be some mobility or maybe some walking concerns or gait issues with people um, that may suffer from that yeah um, have you experienced that and in, in your line of work oh my gosh are you kidding <laughs> <laughs> yes every single day every single day we see someone who falls up living with dementia um and that you know to to to, to derail your point just for like one second if your person lives in a facility and they and they're and they have dementia they're living with dementia and they live in a facility you 100 percent need to know what the policy is if your person falls because mm -hmm. we harm people when they come into the er and they stay in the hospital we don't mean to we're well intentioned but when mm -hmm. someone rolls in after they fall we we and they can't tell us what happened because they're living with dementia mm -hmm. then we, we start to look for reasons why they may have fallen other than just they like bumped they bumped onto something and lost their balance and fell. We start looking for medical reasons why they fell. And then they get blood work, they get a urine, they get, you know, they get their head scans, they get all this tests done. And I'm not saying it's not 
always necessary. Sometimes it is necessary. And some, but sometimes you can't tell just by looking at the person and examining them, you know, what could have caused them to fall. So you need to know what the plan is if your person falls, especially if they don't seem confused, they're not bleeding, they're moving everything like they normally do. They don't seem like they're in pain, like there may not be benefit in actually coming to the ER. And I think that I think advocating for that side of things is something that I have to say. I know that's not what you, you know, but it's part of it. Really? Falls, <laughs> falls are so, so common and we, it falls in aging in general, but even more so in dementia because you have, you lose the safety awareness, you know, and then depending on what area of your brain is affected, what type of de disease that's causing dementia, the person is suffering with, they may right. be more at risk. So like Lewy body, Parkinson's dementia, they've got autonomic blood pressure issues, more at risk. Yeah. So it's like, there's all different types of reasons why, but, um, but super, super common. And I think that if you're keeping your person at home, there is actually, you can actually get training on well, first off, you can ask for a fall assessment and do things in your house to make it safer, but you can actually take online training now about how to decrease the risk of falling. So occupational therapists are coming online too. So I know somebody, her name is Amelia Borland. She's inside of our Facebook, my Facebook community. Um, okay. there's, all, there's all kinds of ways to educate yourself to, to help with falls, but medications are a cause of falls. And so, you know, that's why you need to know what your person is taking. And I would say that the plan, the planning piece of medications has to be looked at because we can't mm. just continue medications to continue them. We need a plan for what to do with these blood pressure medicines if someone gets sick right. and they're not eating and drinking, you know, especially that. So those are my two cents. There's like people writing things, Delon. Yeah, man, <laughs> they, they are blowing up. Uh, Christy Jones was uh, commenting on tramadol not being the best. Mm. Uh, she was saying what medication a person with dementia that has taken tramadol for a long time in the past can take for knee pain. So she was more so asking what can she consider? Mm. Mm -hmm. She's just realizing that tramadol isn't doing anything for her. And it's, anything. and it's sometimes the case, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, Christy, I would say for that, you know, one, you need to know why your person has knee pain to really know how best to treat it. Cause there may be things that can be done, injections, then I don't know if that's even possible for you to get your person somewhere to have that type of treatment done. But I will say that um, a topical like biofreeze, um, I I have found a lot of patients tell me they love biofreeze. It's like a gel mm -hmm. that you rub on and then you put ice on top of it. Make sure you wash your hands or make your fingers go numb. But um, that's one thing that you can do that's a not, you know, that's safe and not something that you would have to ingest. But that's tough, you know, like, because because it depends on your person, whether or not they could take Tylenol and NSAIDs, and then there's a risk there. So, but they're really, pain is so tough, you know, back pain, knee pain, joint pain. It, it is, it is a like kind of impossible situation to get someone completely out of pain. Um, and then giving the meds. And I, I think you would agree with me, Nalan, and Nalan is that like, it is an individualized decision and it's based on the risk versus the potential benefit of each drug that we consider. For sure. So. For sure. I mean, you nailed it. I nailed it. I mean, we, like you mentioned, we're treating the whole patient, not just your mm -hmm. symptom. That's what we miss in clinical practice. So I love, I love liniments. I love things like Bengay, Icy Hot. Uh, I love those TENS devices, a little electric shock mm -hmm. machine you can put mm -hmm. you know, back aches, lower back pain. I don't know if you noticed, but the FDA just released this really cool virtual reality uh, uh, headset. Okay. That people who suffer from lower chronic back pain can okay. get this VR headset sent straight to their home, FDA approved. And essentially, you can go through eight weeks of what's considered cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. Teaching you like ways to disassociate from your pain, how to kind of woosaw around it, how to do other mm -hmm. things to uh, lower it. And they've statistically proven that it's improved their pain. So wow. it's crazy, but yeah, this is going you know yeah yeah i mean that's definitely i think vr would be really interesting i haven't seen any data on it and and in, in people living with dementia but i'm sure some people would benefit from you know from it so yeah for sure for sure another uh, thank you thank you christy for your comment uh pamela tuned in she was saying and reiterating hey we have to know our personal goals and what mm -hmm. the treatment plan is so we are mm -hmm. all for that. And Pamela mm -hmm. also agrees. She likes biofreeze <laughs> as much as you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I get that. 
Christy followed up mentioning that that knee pain was actually mm -hmm. it's on bone on bone. So it's a little tough for her. She can't do much with the cold. I'm sure she could probably tell when it's about to rain. I have a friend who had that oh, issue. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's hard for her to manage. So I'm not yeah. sure if she's considered physical therapy um, or, or braces. I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. I don't know how to quite handle that. But I'm all about other approaches. I'm, yeah. I'm, and maybe even chiropractor or acupuncture could be an option if it was exhausted. And acupuncture can be covered for a couple sessions, not all, um, mm -hmm. on Medicare. So that could be a consideration. Yeah, I would just take a holistic look at her, Christy, and ask if there's anything else. But I mean, you you may not you may not come up with an answer, honestly, because it's mm -hmm. you know if it's bone on bone and they're not offering surgery, that because that's probably what would need to happen is a, is a mm -hmm. joint replacement, and she may not be a candidate for surgery. So mm -hmm. it's unfortunate, but that sometimes it does happen that we don't have we don't mm -hmm. have we don't have a solution, and we just have to manage manage as best we can with with, with other modalities, but. Um, anyway. I love it. And so when you mentioned falls risk, it, it had me segue yeah. to our other module in our deprescribing accelerator where we talk about deprescribing for dementia. And we specifically talk about falls risk and how there is an algorithm clinicians can use called mm -hmm. the steady falls risk, which mm -hmm. is S-T-E-A-D-I. Mm -hmm. um, she's drawing a blank on what the acronym means, but essentially it's a quick tool you can use developed by the CDC and one of my professors, Dr. Stephanie Ferrari, who is a pharmacist and has a passion for community pharmacy and de-prescribing. Mm -hmm. So clinicians, if you're unsure of a med list, they have an algorithm where you can plug in a person's profile and mm -hmm. assess what their risk could be of potentially falling. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something I use to kind of assess what's a proponent or what's a potential candidate to be de-prescribed. Mm -hmm. Another thing I like to assess, particularly in dementia, and this is more clinical, is looking at the anticholinergic burden. So it's a, a basically a marker that we suspect in dementia. Um, it's a chemical in the brain that we think is just very little. And because there's so little, it, it can lead to basically changes in how we think, our mood and affect, and leads to some of those dementia hallmark symptoms we know. But as clinicians, it's important to look out because you'd be surprised. Things like furosemide have an anticholinergic burden, right? Some of the benzodiazepines have some of that. A lot of drugs have that property. And so when you have one here, one there, they all can add up and that can increase your falls risk too. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing we teach and, and preach in our de-prescribing accelerator so that we're comfortable and not worried about, ah, oh, where do I start with this? We give you the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what what do you see in terms of the world of uh, delirium? I know you're in an ER, so things are fast paced, kind of uncomfortable, but I'm yeah. curious how you guys handle that when you see it. Yeah, I think that um, we do have patients that come in already delirious. Um, that does happen. I would say it's more common that people come in um, not delirious. And well, there's there's different types of delirium, right? So there's the agitated hyper delirium, but there's also hypo delirium. And that is probably what I see more commonly is when people withdraw and they're they're slow and so everybody's like there's something wrong with them. They're just not they're just not them. They're off, you know, mm -hmm. and that is that's more common, you know, and that's going to typically come. I mean, there's so many causes. Medications are a cause, obviously, but um, uh, infection is a big cause, um, mm -hmm. dehydration, mm -hmm. um, right. infection is huge, you know, um, that's one of the most common causes of it. But medications, I, I just harp, that's why I'm always harping on the nurses about make sure you get their med list. And mm -hmm. oh, I do want to say this. So when you come into the emergency department with someone living with dementia, I can't tell you how much it helps me to have an actual physical piece of paper med list, like, because it does a few things. One, it, it actually makes you take ownership of the situation and document the medications and why you're taking them, why your person's taking them. And everyone should do this for themselves as well. So it does that. It kind of gives you that you're learning, right, while you do this and, and keep it updated. But that's the other thing is that so you do this, you learn, you're learning, but you're also then going to keep the this list updated. And you are going to be the best person to make sure your medication list is actually updated. Because I'll tell you, people tell me all the time, just look in the chart. It's in the chart. It's it's there, you know. <laughs> and it's just not like there's medications that don't get canceled. No. There's not there's dose changes that don't get changed. 
You know, right. the nurses in the ER are responsible for doing this and they have lots of patients. They, they have a sick patient. You think they're going to go through your medication list with you? Like, no, they're not. And it's not because they, they don't care. It's because they don't have time and they're prioritizing what they're doing, you know, just like we all do in our entire, everything we do in life. We, exactly. we have priorities, you know, <clears throat> so I tell people a physical list that also helps us be able to better able, um, make sure your med list is accurate in the computer. And I'll also say that that thing will let me stay in your room longer. Hmm. That's nice. That's yeah, a great right? tip. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great tip. You give me, story. you can have a conversation with me about not just your med list, but if you can, if you have your organized like medical history on paper, then I don't have to go to my computer and look at it. And when right. I go to my computer, what happens? <clears throat> I sit down, I'm there. Dr. Lamb, can you can you come over here and look at this patient? They don't look very well. Hey, Dr. Lamb, there's someone on the phone for you. Hey, mm -hmm. here's an EKG. Like constant mm -hmm. interruptions. That's all. That's mm -hmm. part of why we're stressed out. <laughs> and when you <laughs> on the computer, we are really yeah. working. You know, so a physical med list. I can't plug it enough. Yeah. But I love a doctor that asks for a med list. Sheesh. I mean, it's like, you just, this is why we get along so well. But, I mean, come on. <laughs> Half the reason the people are there is because of their medicines. I mean, we know this, right? Like, we, yep. we, what we, what we do in healthcare is there's a problem. Oh, there's a medicine for that. Let me add that to your, let me add right. that to your, to your, what you're doing, you know? And it's just not, it's not right, especially for people living with dementia. You can't do that. You cannot do that. It's inappropriate. No. It's very inappropriate. It's why we're seeing spikes in these issues and well, why we're here to try to save the day. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Pamela helped save me a little bit and got the acronym uh, for the Steady Falls Risk Assessment I mentioned. Oh, that's Stopping, great. Stopping Elderly Accidents, Death that's and Injuries. I love thank that. You, and she also mentions as a tip that she carries a list with the power of attorney and healthcare directives. And I know that's a bit more in your line of work. You care to share more on that, Dr. Lamb? Yeah, yeah. So um, the, well, when we're talking about dementia, so in order to do a medical power of attorney or healthcare advanced directives where you're writing down what you would want if you were unable to speak for yourself, you do have to have capacity in order to make those documents legal. And when I say capacity, I use that term for a reason because you're gonna hear it, you need to know what it means. It basically means <clears throat> that you're actually able to make your own medical, you're, you're able to make your own decisions. You understand what you're reading, what you're signing, why you're signing it, the reasoning behind it. People right. in, in the middle stages of dementia start to lose that ability to, to they start to lose capacity in the middle stages um, of dementia. So they're not gonna be able to do either of these documents. They won't be able to do a medical power of attorney or fill out advanced directives, mm -hmm. which is why it's so time sensitive. So if someone's, starting to have symptoms we're really concerned that this is not just normal aging this is affecting their ability to function we're maybe having trouble with work we're having trouble with getting lost and like the the way the path the pathway to diagnosis of disease as that cause dementia that is when we need to put the medical power of attorney and any advanced directives and in, in place but i also harp that those are tools they are not a plan so mm -hmm. these directives <clears throat> Are not going to tell me in the ER what what we're going to do if your person comes in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They are, they give me an idea of what someone might want, but oftentimes the way they're worded is, you know, if I'm in a terminal illness or I'm in an end stage condition, then I don't want my life prolonged. Well, we don't know that in the ER, almost never. You know, we mm -hmm. don't know. And if someone has terminal cancer, then that's different, right? You know, we might know, but but it's very hard. And so I find that advanced directives are over relied upon because people think that that's a plan. They think that they'll tell them what to do and they, they just don't. So that's why I advocate so much for creating a medical decision plan for everyone who's, everyone who's making decisions on behalf of someone living with dementia. Hmm. That's what I teach inside my program. Brilliant. I mean, I don't think I knew that. So I learned something myself. So guys, I mean, I thought it was enough, but here we mm -hmm. go. I, I stand corrected. So um, I, I'm so glad you shared that because I mean, not only are we both learning, but now I could have a plan for my family, right? I could yeah. advocate for my loved ones a bit more if that if that day comes. So yeah, I love that. Appreciate read that. The, read the directives, read them, <laughs> and, no, and see what they say. See, did they tell you what to do if your person has a stroke? What about if they're septic? 
They don't say that. <laughs> they they talk about they usually talk about when someone would want to stop care, would want it withdrawn. So they don't tell us when to not start critical care, life prolonging care. And if mm -hmm. people if people reach a point in their life when they're living with dementia that they wouldn't want their life prolonged anymore artificially with our medical care, then you know then those advanced directives are not gonna they're not gonna tell us not to do that. It's only their decision maker that can tell us that. Mm. So it's really, really important. So thank you for letting me talk about it. <laughs> Man, please do share away. And it, it seems Miss Pamela completely agrees with you. She says you have to know your person's wishes. You're right. It's not enough to just have a advanced directives and POA. So thank you, yeah. Pam. It's true. Yeah. So, cool, but not a plan. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. I love it. I'm curious what, what questions you may have for me or anything uh, you're curious I mean, about. I, I would like to, I would like for you to talk more about the anticholinergic. Like tell me yeah. some more meds that I need to look out for that may be causing delirium that I'm not realizing, like things that are a little bit less obvious than what we've talked mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's a really cool tool, completely free, um, it's called, um, basically it's called anticholinergic burden calculator. Okay. So I use this and this is another tool I teach within my deprescribing accelerator course, but it's free, okay. it's readily accessible. It makes you make a profile, it, but it looks at all these different awesome, like tools made to assess this risk from across the world. And okay. they put it all in one place and it just tells me and breaks it down based on um, basically anything that has a score of a three or more is okay. considered highly anticholinergic. I think okay. furosemide is like a, a one or a two, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Of course we know benzos have that issue. Yeah. Um, even some like less sedating um, antihistamine blockers like ranitidine or allegra, okay. uh, they have like a one on that scale, right? So if you take multiple. Oh yeah. Yes. Okay. So what it does is it looks at all the med lists, you put it in and it ranks them on a scale. And if anything totals to more than three, that tells us you have a high anticholinergic burden, which again can lead to that confusion, dementia like symptoms, et cetera, and maybe falls risk in some situations. Mm -hmm. So there are quite a few drugs. The the main ones, of course, we know are are good old um um, um, antipsychotic medicine. So mm -hmm. classes of even, even if it's a first generation antipsychotic, like uh, Haldol, Olanzapine, uh -huh. or a newer one, which is Olanzapine, okay. uh, Toroquil, they have some anticholinergic burden, of course, right? Some opioids have some. I did not know that until mm -hmm. I plugged that in. Uh, but okay. some of them, even though we know they're a risk, some uh, just have it based on their chemical structure. Good don't have an explanation why. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think, was there some stomach I medicine? didn't know about Lasix. I, I I have to check that thing. And that's like, it reminds me every time. Oh yeah, I'm so surprised. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I didn't, I didn't that. Know that. that was the big thing that you just taught me. Cause I, and like, and the fact that you have to remember that they all add up because mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people take diuretics, you know, Lasix, you know, a lot of people are on those meds. Um, because heart failure is so prevalent. Super, so. super. And heart failure, blood pressure, you name it. Like there yeah. are so many. Um, try to think of what else comes to mind. Um, I want to try to see if I could like sneak and pull this up. I know. I, I think I found the website, but I obviously I'm not going to create a profile while I'm talking to you. Is this what it is? Is this um, oh yeah, the urinary uh, retention meds, like meds oh. for incontinence, big one. Yeah. Okay. Huge, huge one. So, yeah. uh, gosh. Like oxybutynin. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, that one's like a three, a, a okay. two or three, um, yeah. and a lot of those drugs in that class fall in that in that category. Yeah. Okay. That's a huge one. And of course, we have urinary incontinence if you mm. have dysfunction with, cer with certain cool. physiological things. So. But it's also, that's a, that's a good point that you make because like someone could get put on that medication because they're trying to help, but you could actually cause more harm in doing so. And knowing that in dementia, it is part of the disease progression. So people become mm. incontinent. It's a natural part of the disease. Um, and so should we, should we 
like met, medicate that person. Again, it should be an mm-hmm. individual decision based on their risk, you know, and how, how much that's affecting their quality of life. So, right. um, you know, again, it's like looking at the person as a big picture. Another reason why I support pharmacogenetic and what you do, but also palliative care. Mm-hmm. So I think that that, I think palliative care is really the, um, what can fill the gap between primary care and all the specialists when it comes to people who are living with dementia, who still want to have medical care and still want to have, um, still want their life to be prolonged. Right. They still, they still want to receive that type. They're not ready to be on hospice, which is a focus more on comfort, you know, and and not the, the, the treatment. Treatments that we do for people who are living on hospice should have the primary intention of, of comfort first. So true. Right. But the palliative care is more, I feel like it's, it's really the gap. It's the bridge between it helps you look at the whole person and they do medication reviews. Right. So they, like they usually de prescribe. To- they usually de prescribe. I mean, they, they, they think about it, yeah. they want to think about it, but they want to do what's best for the patient's uh, well being, which I love. So, you know, that's my favorite word. Um, mm-hmm. But when you talked about like what classes, man, there's so many. There are old school antidepressant drugs, there are asthma medications like Spiriva. So, yes, an mm-hmm. inhaler can contribute to that. Um, some people I've seen use something called benztropine. I never liked it, but it's used sometimes when people who are on these antipsychotics are uh, maybe having like excretions or they're drooling or tearing or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so they would give them sometimes these benztropine eye drops or the pill yeah. form to keep them from doing that. But mm-hmm. that also has an anticholinergic burden as well. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of classes that fall into that category. Um, and that's why I think if you want to learn more, you could consider taking our D prescribing accelerator course. But there's so, so many. And of course, we cannot forget some of those over-the-counter sleep meds. Mm. Cannot forget Benadryl. We cannot forget Benadryl, the doxylamines, the unisoms, mm-hmm. they also have an anticholinergic burden as mm-hmm. well. Be careful of that. And that doxylamine, I think that's in a lot of cough and cold medications. Yep. That, that's the that's the like sleep medicine that gets tucked into those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It sure is. It sure is. Um, yeah. Mainly used for sleep. And people say all the time, use it for sleep here and there. But mm-hmm. it's a big no-no in the world of uh, dementia. So. Again, mm-hmm. we're here. We're coming for you, dementia. We're, yes. we're coming for these preventable issues, right? We're trying yeah. to make a difference here. So. You know, because I've heard cases too. I'm sure you've seen this. I know you've seen it because you've talked about it, where someone's just over medicated and you strip back their medicines and then they're they're okay. You know, I mean, it's a big mm-hmm. deal. I, yeah. I know that you've, yeah, you've talked about how someone was on 20 meds and you're like, what are we doing here? So you take them all back <laughs> and then they're a different person. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's it's a headache. It's a headache. Um, but there's opportunity. And, you know, it's it's platforms like this that allow us to not just share our wisdom, but hopefully give you guys some immediate values. So, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, I'm curious, you know, if the audience is still tuning in, we got three people watching live, one other on uh uh, my Instagram. So if there are any like last minute questions, we're going to yes. hang out for a few more minutes. So we would love to hear your thoughts. This is again is Dr. Brittany Lamb. Go ahead and check out her website. Can you remind us what your website is to yes. learn more about your course? It's, it's B as in boy or Brittany. <laughs> and then it's lamb. It's blammd.com. So my first name B and then lamb like a sheep md.com. Love it. So I went ahead and so put, uh, put your website in the chat. Go on ahead and check out your course. Of course, you can always check me out at geriatrics.org. I'll put that in the chat as well. G-E-R-I-A-T-R-X as in x-ray.org. Um, would be happy to answer any questions if there are any, or if you just want to reach out to us and get that medical care plan, you know, contact Dr. Lamb. We're, we're good people. We don't bite. We're doing this out of our hearts and we just love advocating for our caregivers and our families managing their loved ones with dementia. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I second all of that. Go go work with Dr. DeLon Canterbury because he is the best. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just love the work that you're doing. And I think that, you know, obviously you're still working with clients and patients, you know, and families, but 
the deprescribing uh, accelerator program for clinicians out there, you know, it, or people who just want to advocate, you know, in, inside of a facility. I mean, there is a cost associated with it. So I, you know, I don't think the individual family caregiver is really who you're targeting, but, um, you know, but facilities like the hospital systems, you know, I can't recommend what you're doing enough. Um, it's, it's so needed, and I, I wish it was part. I wish it was part of the medical um, education and medical curriculum, you know. And that's another yeah. angle. I may. I just met someone. I think I need to connect you with somebody. Yeah. I just. It just popped into my mind. Um, okay. So yeah, I'll. I'll. I'll um, we'll have to email about that. So just. Let's do it. That. That's yeah, actually my goal is to require this in every pharmacy school, medical school, nursing school in my next in the next five years. Yeah. And, since our course is already CE accredited for all of those professions, it should be a no brainer to put this into a curriculum. Yeah. And a small secret, we did have an insurance company uh, consider taking our course to train their staff. So hopefully they can implement deprescribing on a large uh, scale. So I'm curious to see how that goes. So I'm excited for 2023. Any awesome things you're working on this that year? That's awesome. Or? Well, I'm just, um, I'm putting the first couple of rounds of people through my course and getting feedback from them. And I'm hoping to get in with some area agencies on aging um, to reach more people. So sure. um, yeah, it's a, it's the start. I mean, you're, you're farther ahead in your journey than I am, but I'm so happy to be, be, do, be doing this because, you know, as you were saying, I mean, we are doing this partly out of the goodness of our heart, but this is also a way that I've been treating my burnout, um, mm. burnout frustrations. And mm. it really has helped so much. Um, and it's my exit path out of the ER when I decide that that's what I'm ready for. So, um, headphones um, modality. Yeah. I mean, I, I so get it. That burnout killed my soul not too long ago. So <laughs> that is why I left retail pharmacy uh, from being a pharmacy manager for so long. Uh, and seeing the problems that you talk about and being a part of the problem, because I was just peddling those pills without really questioning after a while, because I didn't have the, the support and I didn't have really the incentive. As much as I yeah. wanted to in my heart, I just didn't have the time or incentive because you said it, we're prioritizing things and it's kind of low on the list. So mm -hmm. polypharmacy is real, prescribing cascades are real, and our job is to stop them before we continue to add to the issue. I love it. When you say prescribing cascades, you mean like when we just keep adding stuff? What is, can you tell me? <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. I love it. It's a good <laughs> question. Good question. Uh, so prescribing cascades are essentially uh, a misdiagnosis of someone's symptoms as a brand new health condition. And you've Got alluded it. to it. Basically, you add one drug on, say you add an uh, ibuprofen for pain the ibuprofen leads to feet swelling or water retention. Mm -hmm. So now we're adding a diuretic mm -hmm. to treat the side effect of that first drug. But now your diuretic has your electrolytes out of whack. So you're on potassium and sodium. <laughs> so it ends up being a cascade of different drugs added on yeah. that leads to more harm had we just stopped the first issue and found that it was more a side effect, not a condition. Yeah. Uh, so that's what prescribing cascades are. Yes, ma'am. I'm glad to learn that term. Now I'm going to start using it. <laughs> you got to. You got to. Only pharmacy uh, I've been using prescribing cascade. I love that. <laughs> yes. So much. Um, one of our um, attendees wanted to learn more about that virtual reality headset. Oh, um, okay. That, okay. That's used for chronic pain. And so I'm going to put a link in the comments from Harvard medical school about it. Um, this was approved actually last year in 2022, um, but it's a virtual reality headset. It's called Ease VR Virtual Reality X. So Ease VRX. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put this in the chat so everyone uh, can get uh, some comments. So Amy asked that. So I want to go ahead and hook you up with that. Um, but it was so cool when I, you know, was doing the work for my program to see mm -hmm. that they announced this. Um, and again, they've had significant results. In fact, in just 15 minutes of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, they've seen about a 66% reported 30% reduction in pain mm -hmm. compared to 40% in the control group. 
So definitely significant in seeing this. Um, and there were lasting effects too. It didn't just go away once you stop treatment. Yeah. Okay. So that's yeah, I'll have to look into that because I might I'm, I'm start recommending it to my patients. You know, yeah. Maybe anything we can do to treat any other adjunctive therapies. You know, and it, we're always learning, and new research is always coming out, and um, lots of new developments. And I I think the wellness and prevention side of things is just going to continue to get better. Oh so. yeah, it's not going away. It's yeah, people are interested. I think more people are interested um, in learning and and stopping what they see happening you know, from happening to them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why the time is now to strike. And I'm calling you guys out. You guys have been following me. Stop waiting for your passions to just fall into your lap. Like take charge of your destiny. Stop that burnout. Stop feeling frustrated. Stop feeling like you can't take a break. Do something different that aligns mm -hmm. with your heart and aligns with why you got into this profession. That is the entire point of my deep prescribing accelerator. It's not about me it's about our seniors and it's about aligning what we were meant to do in a way that gets us paid and gets us a lifestyle that we can enjoy ourselves right all this work yeah. and then just what die in a couple years and yeah you're not yeah that's not, worth it. That's not, worth not. It. i totally agree it's like we i think we pigeonhole ourselves as professionals into thinking oh i'm just a pharmacist oh i'm just a doctor no, like you learn so much, so many skills that you can put into practice. You don't even realize it until you stop thinking that way. Um, mm. it's, it's the way it's our mindsets, like the way we're wired when we're trained in healthcare. You know, you're you're giving, you're giving, you're giving, and mm. then you're not actually thinking about wait, wait a minute, do I actually enjoy this? Is this is this is this making my quality of life better? How is this mm. impacting me? And that frustration mm. you have with the healthcare system, like find that thing that you want to fix because that thing is a problem for so many people. And I just, I want more people to come online <laughs> and do what, you know, and do what we're doing because this is how you can reach so many people and, mm -hmm. impact and change on your own terms, right? You can do it on your own terms, so. Yeah, I mean, I am I have a job and I'm all over the country, all over the world. And I'm not trying to brag, it's just, I'm, I'm grateful and blessed, man. And I want this for everyone. Like it's, yeah, it was a struggle in the beginning. I didn't know what I was doing, but we're going to give you that guidance with our program, but we're going to show you the ways to not make the same mistakes I did in the beginning so you can get fast tracked. And honestly, Brooke, Dr. Lamb, we're on the same boat. It doesn't matter what time you start your journey. You're on the same journey. So even though I may be a little different or ahead, <laughs> there is no ahead. You're on the right path if you're showing up today doing what you're supposed to do. So yeah. I so, so, so just appreciate your time and tuning in and hope you guys found so much value. Again, I'm Dr. Delon Canterbury. I'm a geriatric pharmacist and founder of Geriatrics, as well as a de-prescribing accelerator. Dr. Lamb? So I'm Dr. Brittany Lamb. I'm an ER doctor, and I help families of people living with dementia think about making a medical decision plan for the future so that they're not stressed out making crisis decisions in the ER and the hospital. Oh, man. I love it. We're a worst nightmare for <laughs> dementia. So hope you guys loved it. Um, tune in next week for our next red pill versus blue pill. You guys take care. Bye. Later. <laughs>